Uh, good morning. I'm the director of uh, SOAS, Valerie Amos, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you to the first uh, SOAS Africa uh, conference. And I very much hope that uh, you like uh, the title uh, of the conference, Imagining Africa's Future, Language, Culture, Governance, uh, Development. And for us here at SOAS, um, including those important dimensions of culture and language is particularly uh, important. Uh, because it's the thing uh, uh, and perspective that we think makes our work so very special. Today's two-day conference forms the final SOAS Center for African Studies event, uh, which is part of our SOAS centenary. And today's conference brings together some of the leading international researchers and scholars on Africa from universities across the continent. Uh, including uh, from Zambia, uh, South Africa, uh, but also uh, in Europe as well, uh, Germany, France, uh, Italy. So thank you all very much uh, for being here. SOAS has a very long history, given that we're 100 years old, of engagement with and scholarship on Africa. We received our Royal Charter in 1916 and our first students in 1917. And from the very beginning, Swahili and Bantu languages were taught by Alice Werner, who toured extensively in Africa and was one of the first scholars to join the school in 1917. By the mid-1930s, the school offered courses in Hausa, Yoruba, Zulu, Twi, and Sosha. And in 1938, we added Africa to our name in recognition of our teaching and research in African languages. Looking at the world today and some of the very important debates uh, that we are having, um, here at SOAS, for example, we're having uh, a debate about how we continue to uh, decolonize uh, our uh, curriculum, uh, for example. It's sometimes hard to appreciate the progress which has been made in terms of scholars from the continent uh, itself having an important role in writing, uh, reporting, uh, researching the issues of uh, importance to the continent, but also the connections between that and the rest of the world. So we have used this centenary not just to celebrate, but also to reflect and to look forward. We're very conscious that uh, there are lots of uh, disruptive events going on in the world, that we're seeing a more fragmented as well as more interconnected and interdependent uh, world. Uh, at SOAS, we very much see uh, part of our strength as being our uh, diversity and linked to that, our commitment to inclusivity. It's not an easy place to be when you have political movements that are moving in exactly the opposite uh, direction. Uh, our commitment to uh, values around justice, equality, uh, is very, very strong. Um, uh, we're a passionate uh, institution with alternative perspectives, and we think that those perspectives are more important in the world today than they have ever been. Because if we don't continue to challenge what is increasingly becoming a narrow status quo, then those of us who believe in the interconnectedness of uh, peoples and continents and the value and richness of that uh, diversity, our world uh, will shrink. So one of the uh, things that we've been doing um, is to uh, look more and more at how we can strengthen our partnerships across the world, uh, including on the African continent, because it's through these international partnerships that we see the enormous potential of our work to make an even greater and lasting difference in the world. So that's why uh, events like today and the whole series that we have done as part um, of our centenary, but going back even further than that, remain so important. Today is about looking at how together we can not only imagine Africa's future, but bring the people together that can make it happen. There are also plans for us to launch a SOAS Africa Institute that will bring together all of our expertise, 
uh, here at SOAS, but also linking to the partnerships and the people uh, that we work with on Africa. Uh, and through that institute, continue to bring together world-class researchers to discuss and debate some of the most challenging and pressing issues in the world. So whilst I hope you have a good time today and have an enjoyable day, I hope you're going to work really hard over the next couple of days and that there will be some conclusions that we can take forward uh, together uh, that will continue to help to ensure that Africa's place in the world as we move forward is as it should be. We have, uh, last year, uh, we put together um, a short video called Questions Worth um, Asking. And one of the things that um, we did, which many people do, is to turn the world upside down um, and to look at it uh, from different perspectives. That's what's so important uh, about uh, today, but that's what's also so important about our collaborations going forward. So I'm delighted to welcome you, and I'm going to hand over to uh, Mashoud, uh, Professor Badrin, who uh, is head of the Center for African Studies. Have a good couple of days. <laughs> who is wearing traditional gear just for you? Yes. He doesn't, he doesn't look like this every day. Oh, I, no. think, I think you should. Oh, I will try. Uh, especially in summer. Especially in summer. Yes. <laughs> thanks. Thanks a lot, Valerie. OK. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much. I mean, Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to everyone. As Valerie mentioned, my name is uh, Mashoud Badrin. I'm professor of law here at the School of Law and chair of the Center of African Studies. I'm here to welcome you all on behalf of Center of African Studies, which is the organizer of this event, and also on behalf of the committee, uh, the conference committee, consisting of myself and my colleagues here, Professor Federike, uh, uh, Lupe, our expert on multilingualism in Africa, and uh, Paul Asquit from Africa Foundation for Development, AFORD, who have been our long-standing partners. I mean, we've been doing so much with them in relation to Africa. And also, uh, the manager of the Center of African Studies, uh, Angelica Bashira. Um, Angelica has really worked very, very, very hard, tirelessly in organizing this conference. If I might seek your indulgence, please help me put uh, your hands together for me. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, this is the first SOAS Africa conference, and it's going to be the first of what we plan to make an annual event here at SOAS. Um, we have tried to make it a truly interdi uh, interdisciplinary conference that we hope you will enjoy and also perhaps maybe interact and learn from <clears throat> the many um, um, uh, experts that we have been lucky to bring here uh, for us at SOAS. When we were planning this conference, uh, we, we thought it was really a very daring exercise to try to make it as interdisciplinary as it has been. But we think and hope that the way we've put it together, uh, you will be able to uh, enjoy it and we'll be able to reflect together over the future of Africa and also the study of Africa at uh, SOAS here and in the UK. As uh, my director mentioned, that is, I mean, uh, Valerie, the conference also marks the end of our centenary year uh, here at SOAS, whereby our center, Center of African Studies, have delivered three astounding lectures in three African countries. We had a very good lecture in Ethiopia uh, at the African Union, and in Ghana, the University of, Ligon, University of Ghana in Ligon, at the Institute of African Studies. We also had one in South Africa, the Fort Hare University. Um, thanks to these initiatives, we have been able to foster collaborations, very strong, strong collaborations in relation to um, Africa with many institutions on the continent. <clears throat> and we hope to continue to do so as we move into the next century of SOAS. It has been, I, I mean, resumed as the head of Center of African Studies, uh, chair of Center of African Studies a couple of years ago. And I can say that it has been a truly amazing year for the center. And we are thrilled to be able to end the year with this incredible two days conference. This conference will have not been possible without the generous support of many of our partners, uh, such as Hunting and Williams Law Firm, 
you see their logo there, now they are partnering with us on this conference. Then African Foundation for Development, Afford. I mean, as I mentioned Paul earlier, I mean, we have been partners for quite a while. The Royal African Society and the Society for the Study of the Sudans in the UK and uh, uh, Taiwan Gallery for the generous support uh, of the photographic exhibition which we have here. I mean, uh, we also thank, uh, we thank all of them so much. I mean, uh, and also on behalf of SOAS, we thank all these partners. We'll be starting with the first panel, but before we move to panel one, I will just want to draw your attention to all the other activities that are taking place over the two days we have here, so that we have this also on our mind. You will see this on the program. One, uh, we, I want to suggest that you should not miss on the photo. We have a photographic exhibition on the first floor of the Brunei Gallery by a leading South African artist, Mohao Modi Saking. This has been brought to us by uh, uh, Taiwan Gallery and with the support of SUAS Brunei Gallery. So you can check this, a, a program of guided tours. So check this and try to visit the exhibition. Secondly, we have two main workshops. Uh, apart from the panels here, we have two main workshops, one on publishing and the other one on alternative forms of protest, uh, which will be in room B102. That is on the first floor above us here, room B102. Uh, then thirdly, we have a film screening uh, by Kenyan uh, director, Judy Kibinge, which will be followed by question and answers by one of our colleagues here, Dr. Lindy Wedobe. I also want to say, do not miss out on the marketplace in the Brunei suite up here. We have a marketplace there where you will find many of our partner organizations displaying the activities. Uh, you'll also find publishers with latest publications on Africa on display, which we can all, I mean, pick from. Uh, do not miss out on the workshop by Africult, a literature platform launched by SOAS students, which was quite interesting. Um, a list of the, all these organizations you will find on the program uh, list. We have, at the end, we have an end of conference party where we'll be having a concert that's uh, tomorrow uh, with musician Kokumbasi and a DJ set, uh, um, Mogadisco, in the SOAS student union area in the SOAS main building, uh, in the Phillips building, the student area, union area. So we hope you all, uh, after the conference, be part of the conference party and concert, uh, concert. Throughout the two days, food and refreshment are provided in the Brunei suit, in the uh, marketplace, where the marketplace is located. Now, I don't want to take, I mean, further much time. I want to say a big thank you to the Center of African Studies staff. Uh, Anna, Anna Dimitis, Anna, please. Anna has been happy. Please, rather than for Anna as well. She has been very, 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 very helpful. I mean, I think it's always very necessary to acknowledge people who work very hard because we are the, our academics, our faces show all the time. You know, they, they do incredible work, I mean, to make these things possible. Thank you so much, I mean. Uh, also to uh, Raquel Villa Perez and Barbara, I mean, uh, all of them are, are out there. And all our volunteers, we have so many SOAS alumni who are volunteering to make this uh, a successful event. Now, before I take my exit, I want to hand you over to my colleague, uh, Frederike, uh, to who will be the chair of the first, I mean, uh, panel, uh, titled Creating and Claiming Identities. So if you, I might seek the indulgence, the first panelists know themselves. I want to invite them onto the platform and hand over to Federico. Thank you very much. Um, dear friends, Thank you all for being here. It's my great pleasure to um, kick off with the first panel of this conference that I hope will set the tone in a very positive uh, way. Um, oops, let me do it like this, sorry. So, if we talk about identities, um, it seems to me that there is a big contrast to be made between two different ways of imagining identities. And um, 
Alain Mabanku, the Congolese novelist and essayist, has captured this contrast in much better ways than I could possibly do. Um, starting in an essay that explores uh, how Africa could contribute to in pensée monde, you know, a new way of global thinking um, to which Africa should contribute. He contrasts two different ways of conceptualizing identity, and one that he associates with Western philosophical thought is thinking of being, essential or essentialist thinking of being, and is totalizing. And he contrasts that with an African way of conceiving identities that is based on relations. So it needs to be multiple, situational, and changeable. And in his uh, introductory essay to this uh, collection, uh, Penser et écrire l'Afrique aujourd'hui, um, he has a quote that for me really captures what this panel hopefully will be about. Um, so for all of you who don't read French, uh, here is my very imperfect translation of this quote. And uh, I just wanted to throw that to the panel, uh, maybe to provoke uh, some reaction. He says, we have solved the identity question, at least in theory. Certainly, the debates continue. But no serious voice would deny today that we are made out of different genealogies imbricated into each other, that there is no origin except in junction and relation, or that Africa is above all the body of a vast diaspora and hence a body in circulation. So this is exactly, I think, what this panel is going to be about, how identities are created, how they are claimed, reclaimed, how they exist in a context um, that has been influenced by colonialism and by the continuing existence of the post-colonial nation state and its Western ideologies of fixing, of standardizing, of totalizing, and how other forms of identity coexist and also conflict with this concept. And I'm very happy to have six panelists who are really diverse in their disciplines, in uh, the institutions they're based in, uh, in gender and in perspectives um, that will discuss uh, identities with me. Um, so here are the panelists, and you can see them there, and they will talk. Um, each for 10 minutes, and these are the questions that I gave them to think about. Um, but we do not only want to have a panel talking to you, we really hope that we can make this a very interactive and inclusive panel. And so we have the 10 minute uh, panel presentations, and my dear panelists, you know, speaking the universal language of football, um, here are two cards. This one tells you you have three minutes left, and this one tells you time is up. Um, followed, uh, following the panel discussions, we will have 30 minutes of panel discussion. And even here, I would invite you, the audience, to contribute. I have here a pack of index cards, which I will hand over to you, so please scribble your questions um, on these index cards and give them back to me, and I will make a selection of questions to be put to the panel for the panel discussion. And then finally, we have 30 minutes um, audience question and answer sessions. So we will have the index cards. There will be audience mix for the Q&A, I believe. And finally, um, we also have a hashtag, so as Africa. And that is not only for questions that you may have regarding this panel or for ideas, comments, but it's also um, to give you the chance to tell us what you would like to see at the next Africa conference. Which themes would you like to see covered? Which, which questions do you have? Um, this being said, I think I will shut up now and hand over to my first panelist, Rama Saradian. Hi, everyone. 
everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be there and to share with you today. Uh, first of all, I would like to share a video, some music to uh, warm up, and I will see some moves, I hope. So uh, please, I just saw this from uh, Prof. Duete. Pay attention to how many uh, languages you think you recognize, and we'll discuss later. De cher contre des reflets, 400 ans après ils sont revenus. Ils veulent nos cœurs pour des revenus. Oh. Ils nous colonisent, ils nous utilisent. Esclaves au champ, ils venaient nous chercher. Ils n'ont plus d'espace pour leur survie. Ils violent nos terres et veulent l'exploiter. Johnny Dema, Nati Wode. Daudi Sarim, Tony, Top Allah, Gauri Gassi, Aïna Benogi Oro. Les nuits baillées, les nuits d'unées, ce nous souffre si vous nous fiez. Ça me catapi, n'a pas catapi, ce vent baillé, Juriye Kderi. Wamban, Panay, Changai, Pizno, Walo. Perlo, Futa, Seino, Kaza, Kamba, Kaulak. Fanaïvi, Benida, Lope, Lady Amen. Gesse, Remete, Nier Fouda, à la place. Fanaïvi, Benida, Lope, Lady Amen. So this uh, is a song from Bide Wubes. It is a Senegalese uh, rap group, uh, and they are talking about land in the northern region of Senegal. So it is interesting. Uh, what they are saying basically is that they are saying no to the neo-colonialism, saying no to these invaders, white coming to uh, take their land. So in this song, we find uh, um, the discourse that we uh, meet in the uh, research on land grabbing. There are polar positions. I'm not saying that I am against or for them, but it is interesting. How many languages have you uh, identified? Four? Six? Six. Which ones? <laughs> okay. Uh, personally, I have identified five, maybe because I don't speak the sixth. So, uh, coming to the presentation. <coughs> so, I first talk about how I got interested in this research on. Uh, what we call land grabbing or the land rush or there is no consensus uh, so far on uh, the term to be used. So in 1996, a woman uh, lost her land because the state was developing a large scale infrastructure development uh, uh, project in the banlieue of uh, Dakar. And this woman is my mother. And today, 21 years later, she's still trying to recover the land. So this is how I got interested, because I believe the personal is political as a feminist, and we need to research uh, issues that uh, touch us. Land, uh, I got interested in land because I think it's a perfect way to get uh, to know more about the culture, people, their identities, uh, because it is socially embedded. When you study land, you study various aspects of a people's culture, political life, etc. And I'm also interested in the evolution of tenure systems. A tenure system, uh, land tenure is an institution. It means it's a set of rules invented by societies to define how land, uh, uh, access to land is, um, is uh, defined. And I think talking about culture, claiming identities and so on, we cannot ignore the current debate uh, that one president has brought when he said that Africa has a civilizational problem. 
and I have a problem with that. And uh, talking about the cultural development nexus, I think it's important to note that this has to do with the three or so problems that we have when we study African culture at large. First is how we reduce them uh, through the dominant Euro ethnocentric paradigms to negativity, how we isolate them or make minimum usage uh, when we think about nation state building developmental uh, options or how we instrumentalize them. And I think uh, Prof. Luek Pei has made the perfect introduction when he, she talked about culture as being, because this was a definition I had. I won't uh, be as ambitious as uh, Krober and Kluckhorn, who made a combination of 164 definitions of culture. To me, culture is being, and one cannot progress without being. So when we talk about development, we need to move beyond the uh, antithetic anti uh, uh, relationship that we have seen uh, in theorizing culture and development. There is no uh, development without anchoring it in culture, in my opinion. So the land rush, uh, I will go quickly through this. You can read it, we can have questions after. There has been two ways of knowledge projection regarding the what, what is a land grab. People, there are people who won't even use the term land grab, who would talk about land rush, who would talk about land deals, land acquisitions, land, large scale land acquisitions. And how did it happen, processes, where did it happen? The focus people think is a global south, but it is also happening in Europe and um, in other parts of the world. The why, when, who are the main actors? And uh, the second wave of uh, research has focused on dichotomic assumptions. Who are the local people? Who is a homogeneous local population? There is an inter interesting article by Guilfoy who is talking about the myth of the homogeneous local population uh, in the front of uh, those predators coming to grab the land. And there are missing questions, uh, such as the importance of historical uh, analytical framework, uh, the plurality of uh, legal regimes, agrarian change implications, etc. But what interests me most here is polar positions and how they affect identities and how they shape them. There are people ideologically who believe that small is beautiful, small scale I mean, or uh, small is ugly. And at SOAS I think we are very familiar with this kind of uh, discourse. I see Prof. Uh, Senzang here. And uh, we have also uh, those who think that family farming uh, uh, is the way forward, capitalist farming. Uh, but what we forget is that the, the, the actors themselves have, multi have multiple identities. And here I will use the example. My research focuses on the northern uh, region of Senegal. In this picture, you will see the four presidents we've had so far. Senghor, the president poet, Abdou Diouf, uh, who, who was at the Francophonie, Abdoulaye Wad, and then Macky Sall. Uh, very ethnically diverse. You have the Pula, the Serer, the Wolof, and uh, uh, it is important because land tenure also is diverse. And we've had four faces. Lamana, which is, uh, the Laman were the master of the land. They were the one in charge of attributing land, managing them, and land was acquired by, by virtue of the fire or by virtue of the axe. And after that, we have went through the monarchy and uh, how you access land also started to change. And under colonialism, you see that there are new motivations or preoccupations, which is to qualify to protect the interests and govern the people, govern bodies, and govern assets. How? By the 1964 land law, 95% uh, of the land belong to the nation. It is a national domain. And then you have the family code and such laws that were created in order to better rule and govern. So after you've heard the song, uh, the people you saw are in rural areas, but the singers, have you seen how they are dressed? Senegal is very creolized. And creolization is not only about language. language. It has to do with uh, religion, how uh, pacific Senegal is, 95% uh, of Muslims, yet perfect cohabitation with other uh, religious uh, groups. And you see the le lexical borrowings. People, young people especially, will speak so many uh, uh, creolized Wolof and French, which is not very well seen by the older people who consider 
that you or voila should be pure. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I'll go quickly through the agrarian history. It is marked by rural social dif differentiation and exodus, especially from uh, the northern region to Mauritania or the northern region to Dakar and so on. So this is a region I was studying. You have uh, Jumbo who, who used to be the queen. You have some places, I just, I'm just coming from field works. So some places that have a historical meaning. And in the third picture, you can, this is the house of the Chateau village, but you can see uh, the coast of Mauritania. So this place have many ethnic groups, whether it is the Wolof, the Pular, the Moor, and they live in perfect uh, harmony. And the, ma the main act activities, as you saw in the uh, movie, uh, the clip, were, are agriculture, livestock, and fishing. Uh, and in terms of agrarian change, we went from agri irrigated agriculture to pastoral stock farming due to, to the policies that they have. So now, quickly, why is it a problem in Senegal, land grabbing? Because we have texts that are not in adequation with people's, people's life. And we are talking about culture. Culture is not static. Culture should move to be in adequation with the reality, the lived experience of the people and how they would like to access land. So land tenure should also change. So today we are in 2017, but we have a land law that dates from 1964 because land is sensitive. We've had so many, uh, any governments that come try to attack the land problem and say, we are going to solve it. But they, they make promises, they set up a national reform commission and they just wait for their mandate to end and they, they leave, they, they tried their best, at least. And the constitution is saying that the right of property is guaranteed by the present constitution. It may uh, not be impaired except in the case of public necessity, legally established and subject to the prayer payment of just and fair compensation. What is just and fair compensation? The state says things without being precise. The law is here, but how to implement it is a problem. And this is the same with public policies. So we have the unfinished business of decentralization and land reform, which come and sediment with other problems. People are still identifying with traditional land laws or traditional authorities and don't recognize the modern uh, institution. Uh, and uh, which uh, leads me to the third point. We have diverging visions and meanings of land for one's identity. If you want to have a public policy, you need to acknowledge or you need to understand first what, what you're trying to decide means for the people. And land means different things to different people. Today you can have uh, the, the chef de village of one of the villages, for example, is also the president of an interest group who received funding from the same investment and the son of that uh, chef de village works at the, at the, at the uh, farm. And his wife is part of the labor union. So you see labor union against the land investment. So there is also cultural aspects, and I will end quickly. Uh, investors, are, uh, I can't be definitive here because fieldwork is still on progress, but investors are denounced denouncing a culture of non-conflict, which is called Masla in Senegal. You don't frontally uh, express your disagreements. You still cover it and wrap it nicely. There is also uh, the unfamiliarity with the rural staff workers with uh, the corporate rules. People also, they feel that what happened in the oral, during the consultations is not respected when contracts are written. So there is still a culture of orality and keeping your promise is important. So for them, even though they sign and agree, when uh, the investor come to occupy the land effectively, there is a problem because there is a baobab in the middle of the, of the land that they agreed to give, or there is um, a cimetière, a cemetery in the middle. So it is a problem for them. And so for them, loss of land is loss of identity and legacy. And uh, there are other issues, such as opacity of land deals, current agricultural policies, how many uh, politicians, uh, authorities are also, uh, at the same time, investors themselves. And 
uh, there is a bad combination of politics, ideology, and business. So this is some of the ideas I would like to throw here. And uh, thank you. And wanted to leave you with this. Went to field work with my nine month old. <laughs> and I don't know anymore how to do this. And it was great. <laughs> and I leave you with the statue that I have in this house. Thank you. Thank you, Rama. Um, land related to identity brings us uh, to our next panelist, uh, Rebecca Roaka Bukosa. And uh, her topic is right to histories. So, identity as history. And the floor is hers. And maybe we can we blank this? Because I believe you don't have a PowerPoint. I'll just go to the holding slide. Thank you. Hello. I am grateful to be here. It was quite the trip from Kampala, complete with long applications for visas <laughs> for the British High Commission, and I had to wait um, for my passport from Pretoria in South Africa. Um, I had asked Angelica to schedule my return flight um, a day or two after the conference because I was really excited about being here and especially going to the National Archives in Kew Gardens. Um, the, the reason for my excitement has been from reading a lot of scholar work, books and journals that cited some of these primary documents here of my country's past, of, of my identity that I could not access in Uganda. Um, so this was like, oh, I'm going to see it now. <laughs> um, I have recently taken on an ambitious project uh, to make accessible the story of Uganda, what I can uh, make accessible using the digital um, My interest starts from my inability to access these stories. Um, I'm, I'm curious about what happened, who was there, and all that, but I cannot get that. And I know that there are multiple people in the country that would like to do the same. The stories that we have, it's not that Uganda doesn't have its history with it. Um, we do have a history of a place is coded in the names of the streets, in the things that we remember, in language, in stereotypes, everywhere, monuments, museums, texts. But these also tell their own story of framing and control and who's the authority. I would like to use uh, the story of Omukama Kavarega in my presentation to illustrate what I would like to do uh, with my project. From what we know, from what we read and hear, he was the ruler of Bunyoro from 1870 to 1899. Now the story of Kavarega depends on who you speak to. Um, the dominant narrative is that of a savage, a selfish ruler who did not want civilization for his people. He was said to be rebellious. In my O-level history class, we talked about him as one of the people who resisted, who was rebellious. I went to a Catholic school. Being rebellious was not a good thing. We were not complimenting him. Um, but this is the narrative that has been passed down from the colonial government, the victor in the battle. The other side did not get a chance to tell their story. Certainly not through the same channels and avenues that were available to the government. A different narrative could be 
Kabaega was a powerful ruler. He was one of the greatest rulers of pre-colonial Africa. This was a man who had sustained defense against the British for about seven years, at a time when the empire had more gun power. They still do, but yeah, they had a lot more gun power. But this heroic resistance is mostly unknown or misunderstood. In around 2010, some actors from the Bunero Kingdom tried to, re to tell their version of the story of an, a nationalist ruler who held his, home, his own. Now, Kabaega may be, might be one of the heroic leaders in our past, but Bunyoro can't quite give us that um, because of the very reasons that their version is not the dominant one. They were disempowered from the beginning. Um, they were neutralized by the victor. The region is speaking from a position of power. I don't know how many of you have been there, but in comparison to the rest of the place, if you're coming from Kampala to go to Bunyoro, Bunyoro is pretty disempowered economically. They were never part of the agenda for the colonial master. Neither did they remain part of the agenda for the governments that succeeded. So they're speaking from a position of no power or little power. Now, there might be many Kabalegas across the pro former protectorates and former colonies. But for me, the uniqueness of my country, Uganda, also lies with the age of the population. Despite the age of our leaders, we are one of the country's youngest nations. If the memory of a place is as old as the person, the oldest person in the room, in that place, then the country's average memory could be no less than 30 years. That is younger than post-independent Uganda. So what becomes of those stories if we do not remember them, if we do not have access to them? Now, Uganda also, the government is the custodian of the National Archives. And it's very actively invested in what stories are told of the past and of the present. And that scares me. That com combining that with the inaccessibility of history, that doesn't help the historical consciousness of the country. If as a child, I grew up walking alongside Colville Street and Prince Charles Drive in Kampala, and was told that Bunyoro was poor because Kabalega resisted, that would be the story I know, and the lens through which I would regard him. It wouldn't matter how much work is happening here. It wouldn't matter how much alternative stories are written in libraries here, because they would be behind a paywall in a scholar journal. What remains for me, a young Ugandan in the space, would be the construct that was left by the colony, from Lake Victoria to Markshan Falls to Lake Albert. There are many unequal ways in which we tell stories. The language in which we tell them, the form in which we transmit them, the regions whose stories are told, and the people who get to be informants and those that get to be experts. There are isolated efforts in repackaging this information. There was the Uganda at 50 um, articles from the Daily Monitor that chronicled the story of the making of the nation and heavily cited local work. And there are public historians who write of some accounts on social media. I think that the digital space opens exciting avenues for all audiences. The more people who can read or hear a story, the more responses and versions we can get. We may never get the accurate version, but we'll be open to more questions and more versions of the story. 
I am not interested in refuting story versions. I'm interested in more stories, in more honest versions of what happened, more inclusion. The more we include, the closer we are to the true events and the better our analysis. And the better we know who we are, where we came from, and where we're going. So yeah, that's my ambitious, very ambitious project. Um, thank you for inviting me. And I hope that over the period we are looking at ways to re-examine and re-understand our stories. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca, for your inspiring presentation and also for keeping to your 10 minutes so beautifully. I was reminded of Mbembe and his question of how to decolonize the archive um, in your talk. I think there's a lot of food for thought for us to discuss later. And now our next panelist is coming up. And I admit, I didn't do my homework talking about identity. It's also expressed through names. And I don't know if I should announce Camille Jacob or Camille Jacob. Either. Either. OK. That's a nice African fluid identity. Um, and you have a PowerPoint. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm also starting with the universal um, language of football. Um, at the top, this is born in Ruisseau and die for CRB. Um, they won, so everybody's happy. Um, this was the Algerian Cup final a couple of weeks ago. So uh, my name is uh, Camille Jacob, or Camille, or Camille, I'm not Camellia, I'm not very really bothered. Um, Today, I just want to be talking about um, Algeria and languages in Algeria. I'm going to be talking in order of language change, elite closure, and academic responsibility. But because of the seven, ten minutes I have, I'm going to be mostly focusing on the English language in Algiers. If you've got more questions on kind of the rest of the country and how that plays out, I'm happy to do that in, in the Q&A later. <clears throat> so this is based on my PhD research, which I've been um, conducting um, over the past couple of years, and I'm using mixed methods. So I'm using corpus linguistics, um, ethnography, and linguistic landscape analysis. So very, very briefly, in terms of the um, linguistic situation in Algeria, since 2016, Algeria has officially two official and national languages, which are Arabic and Tamazight, which is the um, standardized Berber language. Um, it also has French as the unofficial second language, which is used in um, administration, it's used in higher education, it's used in the press, it's used in private schools, um, in the cultural sphere, etc. Um, French is still considered the language of the elites, and it is very much heard in, or, or is considered to be heard more in the well-to-do areas such as Hydra and, and Algiers. Um, now, the academic and consultancy discourse around the linguistic situation in Algeria always focuses on concepts such as hierarchy, rivalry, conflicts, um, especially over the authenticities of these different languages. Languages are always described as completely separate, bounded entities. So there is a thing called French, a thing called English, a thing called Arabic, a thing called Berber. Um, and that therefore each of them have a very strong symbolic value. So just to take the case of French, um, this could mean French is uh, colonization, it's the language of the colonizer. It's the language of modernity, it's the language of science, etc. So same thing for each of these languages. Um, hist uh, historically, English has been relatively absent um, and it is still marginal compared to French and Arabic. However, it is growing, uh, or can be seen as being growing. There's increasing demands for private tuition. Uh, there's been calls by parents and by students to use it more as a medium of instruction in higher education, to start uh, teaching English in primary school rather than just secondary schools. Um, and it is starting to be a bit more visible in the streets as well. 
Now, this has often been described as resulting from kind of rebelling against the colonial language, combating neocolonialism, and a shift towards a language that has been decolonized um, or with a more benevolent imperialism. These are not my quotes, obviously. Um, so English is often described as completely new and neutral in the Algerian context. It is neither Arabic nor French. Um, and especially from interviews, there is often this concept of English as the universal language and as the international language. Um, sometimes discussing it replacing French as the favored foreign language in the country. Now, all of these discourses of a de-ethnicized, decolonized um, language is linked to the idea that English could bring empowerment to the country by creating new circles beyond the existing francophone elites. So this would be the idea of, of creating a way of bypassing the existing hierarchies, of moving away from closed systems, so closed linguistic systems, um, very standardized, very strict definitions of language, but also um, moving away from closed economic and political system. Um, this is strangely enough, often found in the conclusions of academic literature on the topic. So seeing English as a way towards a more benevolent um, or positive multilingualism, as a way towards democratization, political opening, and uh, economic liberalization. This is supposed to be happening through two linked pro processes. The first one is English being the language of science and access to knowledge. Um, students and, and people in general are teaching themselves English because English is seen as more um, as easier to learn uh, because it is more for forgiving it is less pedantic it doesn't have an Académie Française um, and people are more forgiving towards each other in terms of accent grammar etc this idea of kind of mastery is something that comes back um, again and again and again Nearly all adults um, in, who are learning the language in private schools are doing so for professional reasons. Um, not always in terms of being able to communicate as part of their jobs, it's often in terms of accessing training or accessing research, especially for medical professionals. Um, everything is published in Anglophone journals. The second process is the idea for, especially young people, a way to create a new identity and a new mode of participation, political participation instead, especially. So sharing knowledge and sharing projects and doing more through TEDx, wiki stages, employability workshops, self-development, everything being cloaked in English. So English being the medium to um, share all of these things, for example, in youth camps or on social media. Um, so it is English as a medium, which is facilitating these personal, professional, and social changes. But um, these programs, especially the youth camps, are prohibitively expensive. Um, the students engaging in all these workshops um, and online are overwhelmingly from the sciences, which means they have received some of the highest grades in their baccalaureate. Um, in order to be able to access these disciplines, or they're at elite institutions, um, which means they're already coming with a significant social, cultural, and economic capital baggage with them. Um, the people who already have access to resources and who already are very comfortable with Arabic, with French, and with the um, academic and professional system are the ones who are accessing English as a way of adding another tool to their arsenal. Um, so, and, and kind of the same idea with whom, who's mobile, and I can go back to this later on. Now, this is a particular problem in terms of how we arrive, even in academic uh, discourse, at describing a language as bringing empowerment, development, and having some sort of magical powers. Um, often is linked to a discrepancy or, or kind of a lack of awareness or discrepancy sometimes between what people say about languages and what they actually do and not paying attention to both sides, which means we can end up describing languages are completely fixed, congealed 
um, written version that have nothing to do with how people lead their lives and what they do with languages in their day to day. Um, often also means that a lot of the research that has been conducted, especially on English, has been done by consultancy, uh, by their in-house research, by cultural organizations who need the conclusions from this research also to justify their funding, to justify their existence. And, and some of these research and some of the links between academia and the English language teaching industry cannot be ignored, including for my own research. As you might have seen from the first slide, I'm in collaboration with the British Council. Most of my research was undertaken in um, language schools. It was undertaken in um, a lot of programs run by the American Embassy. The American Embassy is throwing insane amounts of money um, at all of these workshops on employability, on um, civic engagement, etc. And this is, this is not about providing answers. I don't have answers. What I have is questions, and a lot of questions we need to be asking ourselves in terms of what we are saying and the, the stories we are saying, whose stories we are telling, and whose who's informants we are choosing to put forward, exactly what we were talking about earlier, what impact that is having on the funding, on what gets researched, what gets funded, what and how languages get taught, and also how people then end up describing their own linguistic practices and normality. Um, I can go back, <laughs> I can go on and on and on about it, so I'm just gonna leave you with this. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Camille. I think uh, we will have a very seamless uh, transition to uh, the next presentation um, by Lutz Martin and Sun Xiaoming. Um, who are talking about, I think, very similar issues on two different languages <laughs> imagined as, you know, discrete boxes that can be labeled and how what these languages are and who can own them is hotly contested. So please, Lutz, uh, I hand over to you. And, uh, I don't know where you... Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Lutz Martin. I've been um, at SOAS for a good more than 20 years, I think. Um, and it's really great to be here. I think it's wonderful that we brought this conference together and to get you know, speakers together to discuss these issues, um, which, as Valerie said, are very much close to our heart. Um, I want to start by, uh, by uh, issuing a disclaimer. This is joint work with a colleague from Beijing Foreign Studies University, Sun Xiaoming, and we had hoped that she would be here even actually a couple of days before to work on this. Um, but due to administrative reasons and you know, complications with visas and passport and things, um, she cannot be with us today. And the, the, the negative side effect of that is that even though it's, you know, the talk is meant to talk about house and Swahili, there will be a much heavier slant towards the Swahili, I'm afraid, <clears throat> because that's the, that's the part I know better. But I know there's lots of house expertise in the audience, and we can take that up um, in the discussion. Um, you know, like, like um, previous um, panelists, I wasn't quite sure you know, how seven to 10 minutes works. So <laughs> what, what I've done, I've put the main points I want to make at the beginning, and then we can roll it out later. Um, what I want to, want to you know, mm, claim is maybe too strong, discuss, offer, um, is that um, colonial post-independence language policies created specific language ecologies um, in many parts of Africa, including the parts we are interested here in East Africa with Swahili and, and Northern Nigeria and West Africa with Hausa. Um, and these ecologies are characterized by, and we just heard that in previous panelists, um, by um, monolingual approaches. They are exogenic, that is looking outside of the ecologies for you know, post you know, um, ex colonial languages, English and French. Um, they are hierarchical, I have more to that uh, on that in a moment, um, and often creating artificial standard varieties. And again, it, it's this box thing we just heard. Um, and that's then based on often top down, that is, you know, government imposed education, language, and literature policies. Um, I think there's a number of recent developments which have reacted against this. So this is a sort of more modern 80s, 90s onwards phenomena. 
um, where people started questioning and challenging perceived notions of standards, um, where the functional dimension of African languages are redefined, for example, social media, that's maybe the biggest element, but that we see it in other domains as well. Um, and people do that by drawing on multilingual practices and ecologies, um, by developing new linguistic varieties to try to, to get away from the standard. Um, and we see that artistic language, youth language, language in the digital space, um, and, and the way this works, and I have more on it as well later, um, is that this is largely community and crowd-driven language development as opposed to top-down government-driven language development we had in colonial just after um, independence. Um, but but the, the caveat, is, if you like, is that, that I think in order to make a substantive impact on African futures, these processes of the crowd-driven, community-driven, the questioning, the critical approaches, these processes need to be mainstreamed and institutionally supported in order to really make a change. And I think, I think we need this to make a change, so I think this is important. And then you know, we've, I'm focusing mainly on Hausa, and, and as I said, um, focusing even more so on Swahili, and there are little maps um, where we are. Um, a brief sketch of the pre-colonial context, um, both in West Africa and East Africa, we have multilingual, multi-dialectal language ecologies, we have oral and written literary traditions, we have um, Ajami writing, that is writing in Arabic script in both, both locales, um, and we also have a history of use of lingua francas of both languages. Um, this is an example from Swahili, um, it, it's a famous um, Swahili poem, um, which is actually based here in Soas Library. Soas Library has a, a huge collection of Swahili manuscripts, which are mirrored at the University of Dar es Salaam as well. Angelica, who we saw earlier, has worked quite a bit on that, and there's a project on the way. Um, so that tradition is both in the West and in the, in the East. Um, in colonial context, we have the introduction of colonial languages, of course. We have um, English mainly coming our, our ecologies, but French in the wider African context. Um, we have choice of privileged varieties and the development of standards forms of African languages. So standard Swahili, or it should be key Swahili Sanifo really, um, is based on the Zanzibar variety. And that, that is a political choice which was made in colonial times, indeed by colonial administrators. There was a, um, an inter-territorial Swahili committee was called Different Elements of Language Policy, um, which were largely run by colonial administrators. So the choice about which language, to, which language to develop, which variety to adopt, and indeed the early textbooks we have of Swahili are largely written by learners of the Swahili themselves. So it's like you know, the bishops and the colonial administrators. Um, but that's, that's an effect of the, of the colonial time. And a similar uh, um, a process happened in West Africa, where Standard House was based on the Kano variety, and again, you know, there would have been lots of other choices, but it was again a political choice made in those times. Um, the, that together brought a hierarchy of languages, and with that, a long history of devalorization of African languages. I'll show that in the next slide. Um, the introduction and promotion of Latin alphabet as opposed to Arabic writing, Ajami writing histories, um, promotion of prose literature and translation, also, of course, translation, Bible translation comes in there very much as well. Um, and the buildup of linguistic infrastructure like dictionaries and grammars, literature, both publishing houses and language academies. And the publishing houses there we see later on a divergence between the West African and the East African case. And I'll come back to that later. Um, this is the, um, the hierarchy of languages following work by Hamad Batibo, um, who distinguished between high prestige and status and low prestige and status languages in African context and puts European language on first and the national dominant area, dominant and minority languages. And Batibu works in the context of language endangerment and language documentation. So he is quite keen, particularly on the minority languages angle, angle in this. Um, Post-independence, on the Swahili side, we have the development of Swahili as natural language that became policy in particular in Tanzania, but also in Kenya. Um, we have infrastructure development, institute published universities, so Swahili was built up, and the, the, the colonial, you know, the literature bureaus and the language standard committees, they were taken over into independent Tanzania, and to some extent still exist. Um, and we have an ambivalent relation with English, which still plays quite a big role in Tanzania, despite the strong position of Swahili. And of course, Swahili's function as killer language, as it's sometimes called, with respect to community languages. There are about 250 community languages in East Africa, and a lot of language that happens towards, towards Swahili. Um, and on the Hausa side, we have Hausa used as lingua franca, but no formal official status. Uh, the Nigerian language policy was very much exogenic, very much English-based. Um, and there's nice work, again, by Ari Bosch on the elite closure effect on that and the access to English. It's a, it's a classics in, in, you know, in my language in Africa, at least. Um, 
we have promotion of English as a national and official language of Nigeria, and of course we have Nigerian English as opposed to you know, colonial English, and as opposed to Nigerian pidgin as well. And Nigerian pidgin, I think, plays an important role again to the, the you know the different different trajectories between West and East Africa in this context. Um, this is just a snapshot, a contemporary snapshot of the building of Swahili. This is a sort of government propaganda booklet, really. Um, and it shows Nirere and other famous Swahili politicians. And the, 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 the headline is President Nirere or Malimo Nirere is a builder or is building the national language. And the pictures, the captions are, this is a famous politician. Here he is speaking Swahili, which you know, this is probably true, but of course you can't tell. But, uh, but you can see that the, you know, the push behind it. I mean, it's also interesting, if you look at the way the pictures are presented, if you look at the dress code, this is very much sort of, you know, African socialism, Ujamaa type, 1970s, 80s, Tanzania, but Swahili was very much part of that parcel. Um, I want to briefly go back to, to more theoretical approaches. Maybe there's um, 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 social linguist Bernard Bolski has a theory of language management, where he talks about formal language man management and informal language management. And so far, what we've seen is largely formal language management, this top-down government imposed language management. He, he distinguished that as well. So he has top-down language management, official government state, as opposed to bottom-up language management. And I think in the 80s and 90s, we move more to the bottom-up one. And that's the interesting trajectory we have. Um, there's another distinction I wish to make between different agencies and language development. I distinguish, and there's, these are not discrete units, there's lots of overlap, but typically I distinguish between institutionally driven, that is officially sanctions, lots of money behind it, government behind it, community driven, that there's interest groups and they want to change certain things. And then there's crowd driven, which is essentially individual choices, which then come, come to a much larger effect without explicit negotiation of that. Um, and it's this crowd-driven and the digital space again, which drives development at the moment. Um, so the community crowd of language development in Swahili, we have rise of interest in community language and language support. The idea of language diversity has taken much more hold in the last 20 years than before. Urban youth language, is Sheng in particular, Sheng from Swahili and English combined, has, be has become extremely prevalent. Swahili hippabongo flavor, sometimes it's called, and, and video uses non-standard varieties. And then indeed we have spread an endorsement of these non-standard features. And then Hausa, um, the, I'm not entirely sure about the current situation, that would be something to look into, but, but, or to discuss. But one thing which is interesting is that we have what is called the Kano market literature. So we have in the 80s, the end of state-sponsored publishing of African languages in contrast to Tanzania. And out of that arising a, a, a you know, counterculture underground literary production um, um, process where people just write in house without state legislation and that in a sense gives us this alternative space which didn't happen in East Africa because literary production was very much controlled by the state so you didn't have that space. Um, so this is, this is in, in, you know, examples of Kano market literature. Um, it's from a recent uh, internet um, article which as you can see at the bottom asks towards reviving comatose Kano market literature. So, you know, it's not quite sure what's happening, but this is very much an 80s and 90s thing. Um, but you can see how, how the absence of the, of the you know, top-down approach provides the space where people move into. Um, this is, this is Sheng in Nairobi in Kenya, and you can see this is Barclays Bank. So it, it's, you know, Barclays has, you know, and lots of banks and phone companies in particular have taken Sheng and sort of appropriated that. So this is Pata, Pata Chapa around the corner. Around the corner is an ATM. You can just see that there. So there's a cash point. Pata is standard, so he'll get. Chapa is, is Sheng for money. So this is, this is a non-standard colloquial term for money. So you can see standard Swahili, Sheng, English, and all that to get people to go to the cash point of Barclays. So, so you can see how this complexity comes up in the last maybe 10, 15 years. Um, this, is, this is more for aficionados, and I know I've run out of time, but I'm fond of it. This is a small little morphine called Ag, and I won't bore you with the technical linguistic stuff. I put it here for those who like that sort of thing. Um, but what I'm after is there is a famous Tanzanian rap artist, Sumali, and he had a top hit in 2015 called Hakunaga. Um, and this is the, the lyrics. I'm not too much worried about it, but you can see he plays on this arc at the end. Sakunaga, Ishaga, Sija Onaga, Kesha Nimwaga. And this arc is a non-standard Swahili feature, which comes from community languages. 
Um, and is, you know, so Hakuna is Hakuna Matata from the Lion King. Hakuna means it's not a problem. So he uses this aga without, there's not semantics really, but I think what's happening with this aga is, and I could play it, but I think I've run out of time. You know, there's a YouTube, several YouTube videos. It's a beautiful song as well. But what I think what's happening with the aga is that it's a widespread use of a non-standard feature, and people are quite aware of that. And therefore, it becomes a marker of mainland or non-standard Swahili, outside of the key Swahili Sanifu. And I think, and this, I put the question mark here, I think people like Somali take that quite consciously and use that as a mark of social linguistic non-conformity of innovation. But I'm, I'm, maybe I'm attributing too much intention there, so I'm not sure. But, but you can see how you can explore these spaces. Um, to conclude, um, African languages, even big ones like Hausa and Swahili, are embedded in a colonial language heritage. And you have dominance of English, you have language hierarchies and post standard varieties. Um, Post-colonial instruments and infrastructure of language governance have so far had only limited success in bringing about an African language renaissance that is really bringing, you know, the language, you know, the, the you know, how to say, um, the richness and the potential of African languages to the fore. Um, and then I haven't talked much about three, but I, you know, we can do that later. later. Um, Language-based problems underlie a lot of you know, sub-ultimate performance, like in questions of university education, development, governments, and participation, civic regeneration. So there is a language element to all these issues. Um, and the good news, if you like, is that recent community and creative and language development challenge established power structures. Um, and we have artistic production, modern media, changing popular attitudes uh, which question and change traditional notions of standards and language ownership. But policymakers and agents of institutional driven language development need to harness this momentum to bring about a substantive change in the linguistic foundation of African futures. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lutz, and Sun, although she's not here, for reminding us of the painful colonial history and its continuing influence on how African languages are imagined and this tension that arises. Um, so standardization is needed in order to model a language that resembles the colonial languages in their boundedness. Um, but this language then cannot express identity. So there needs to be a counter movement of reclaiming languages that can express identity. And how then can these languages be developed? This is a, a problem that is still a big, big problem in African social linguistics and an unresolved question. So far we see standardization, codification movements continuing that for me result in what I call strategic essentialism. These languages are not usable, but their very existence makes a claim that is important. And I think um, this is uh, something that will be explored in our next talk as well, not the language question, but this question of identity concepts <laughs> and, um, you know, on which basis they are made. Uh, and two different conceptions uh, conflicting in the context of Liberia. And so this will be the topic of our next presentation by Rob Telny J. Paley from Oxford. So, Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Great, wake you up a little bit. So it's such a privilege to be back at SOAS. Every time I come back here, I feel like I'm coming back home. So this presentation is based on my PhD research, which was done here at SOAS under the guidance and support of Dr. Laura Hammond. And um, my PhD research really was a transnational study of constructions and practices of Liberian citizenship across space and time, and their myriad implications for development. Today's presentation is based on um, an article that's forthcoming in migration studies, and it really looks at a transnational gridlock on dual citizenship in Liberia. Liberia proposed a dual citizenship bill in 2008, and it hasn't been passed for a number of reasons. Primarily, what I argue is that Liberians have two sort of binary conceptions of um, dual citizenship as a policy prescription and also a development enabler. And those binary op uh, 
perceptions of dual citizenship are in direct opposition to one another. So that's why you have the gridlock, the transnational gridlock on dual citizenship. And that's why I argue there's going to be continuous contestations around dual citizenship around Liberia until these particular binary opposition, um, oppositional um, conceptions are reconciled. So in terms of the outline of the presentation, I'll talk about dual citizenship in Africa to sort of guide you into um, the case study on Liberia. And I'll talk about bounded versus unbounded notions of citizenship, not only in the literature, but also in the policy discourse, the policy space. I'll talk a little bit about Liberia's proposed dual citizenship, which I introduced you to already in the introduction, um, and then my methodology. So what were the methodological underpinnings of this research? And then I'll go on to talk about, again, sort of binary conceptions, the rootedness versus the rootlessness, and I'll conclude with some um, observations. Okay, so as you can see, dual citizenship in Africa is incredibly diverse. Um, I owe a lot of this sort of analysis to um, Bronwyn Manby, who's done extensive study on citizenship laws in Africa. And what she found is that 27 countries on the continent, so effectively half of the continent of Africa, allows dual citizenship. Um, in, in sort of myriad forms. There are 10 African countries that prohibit extensively dual citizenship, and then 17 that have conditional dual citizenship. So in some cases, dual citizenship is um, allowed for some people, and in other cases, dual citizenship is not allowed for some people. What's interesting about the West African subregion where Liberia finds itself is that Liberia is an incredible outlier in this respect. Most countries, in fact, 14 countries out of 15 within the ECOWAS subregion allow some form of dual citizenship legislation. Liberia is the only one that does not. So it's an interesting case study on so many different levels. Now, citizenship in the, in the literature. Again, there are two sort of binary conceptions of citizenship around dual citizenship. So there's a body of scholarship and a body of scholars who argue that citizenship is bounded, it's state-centric, and it's bounded within one national territory. And to have multiple citizenships or dual citizenship is sort of an aberration. Um, there's another body of scholars, and I think more and more a growing literature that talks about citizenship as transcending one national territory, one national boundary. And it says that this citizenship is denationalized, it's deterritorialized. In the age of mass migration and mass globalization, where there's constant movement across national borders, you can't necessarily expect people to carry one national um, identity within a passport or um, a citizenship. And there's a growing body of literature that talks about that as not an aberration, but as the norm and should be the norm. Now, if you look at Liberia's history, it's a classic example and an interesting case study on dual citizenship, citizenship, and its discontents. Um, because Liberia was, quote unquote, in the mid 19th century, founded, and I always put that in quotation marks, by black migrants, not only from the United States, but also from the Caribbean, as well as from the Congo River Basin. And as is the case in human history, you find that whenever a country is, quote unquote, founded, it's always in a territory that people already exist. So when these black migrants came to Liberia in the, in the mid 19th century, they found 16 ethnic groups who were already occupying this territory that is modern day Liberia. Now, what I argue throughout the paper is that in the mid 19th century, Liberia was a country of relative immigration, right? So you had these amalgam of identities kind of formulating in this one national territory from different parts of the world. Um, and in the 21st century, in the 20th century, Liberia has been a country of relative emigration, that because of protracted armed conflict in the country from 1989 until 2003, many Liberians left the country. And a lot of those people who left the country naturalized in other parts of the world. Um, and because Liberia doesn't recognize dual citizenship, again, there's contestations about whether or not these people who naturalize should be able to maintain their Liberian citizenship as well as the citizenship of the countries where they naturalized. Now, Liberia's proposed dual citizenship bill, again, it was introduced in 2008. It hasn't been passed yet. What's interesting is that there are particular features of the dual citizenship that are worth um, noting. The first is that it attempts to reconcile contradictions between Liberia's 1973 Aliens and Nationality Law as well as its 1986 Constitution. What's interesting is that the Constitution has very liberal language around citizenship and dual citizenship. The 1986 Constitution says effectively that once you are a Liberian by birth or parentage or, an or ancestry, you are a Liberian by um, forever and ever. So citizenship is never revoked according to the 1986 Constitution. The 1973 Aliens and Nationality Law, on the other hand, basically says that 
If you are born in Liberia and you leave the country and you're naturalized in another country, you automatically revoke your citizenship. It also says that if you are a Liberian by parentage, so if one of your Liberian, um, if one of your parents is Liberian, that at the age of major majority, if you're born outside of Liberia, you have to declare whether or not you maintain your Zhu Soli citizenship, so your citizenship by birth, or your Zhu Sangwani citizenship, so your citizenship by parentage or ancestry, effectively revoking the citizenship of those who were born outside of the country. The Liberian um, proposed dual citizenship bill also enables Liberian women to pass on citizenship to their children. Many laws on the continent of Africa actually do not allow women to pass on citizenship to their children. Now, a lot of people argue that this is an antiquated law, provision within the, within the law, and it's also effectively discriminatory against women. So the bill tries to reconcile that and enable Liberian women to pass on citizenship to their children. Um, another feature that I think is particularly interesting and why there's so much debate and contestation around the bill is that there are not any clearly defined provisions that determine the rights and responsibilities of those who would be dual citizens if the bill is passed. And that's where the contestation comes in. In terms of my methodology, so my methodology was uh, based on semi-structured interviews, multi-sided field work that I conducted in five different urban centers in Monrovia, Liberia, the capital, in Accra, Ghana, in Freetown, Sierra Leone, in Washington, D.C., U.S., and then also here in London, the U.K. And the reason why um, there's sort of critiques around my research, because a lot of people argue that it's very urban biased. But there's a, a scholar by the name of Saskia Sassen who argues that urban centers are the places and the spaces in which citizenship are the most contested. And so that's why I focus on these particular urban centers, looking at urban centers in West Africa, in Europe, as well as in North America. And I interviewed Liberians across different socioeconomic positions as well as different spatial um, positions across the globe. Now, there are two frames, again, that I talked about a little bit earlier um, around dual citizenship, the conceptions of dual citizenship amongst Liberians, my respondents. Um, a number of Liberians adopt what I call the sedentarist metaphysics. They talk about citizenship as being rooted, right? So stasis, maintaining position, physical space in one location, Liberia particularly, is assumed to be the natural order of things. And this comes from the work of Lisa Malky, right? So fixity is privileged in this frame. Um, and people are often thought of and think of themselves as being rooted in place and as deriving identity from that rootedness. So citizenship particularly, right? In this frame, mobility is pathological, it's dysfunctional, it's threatening. And mobility is seen as the absence of commitment and attachment and involvement within the national territory, right? And I'll share with you a quote from one of my respondents that basically personifies this notion of rootedness about citizenships should be bounded within one national territory, Liberian citizenship, that is. And she says, if people have dual citizenship, they are basic, basically in a win-win situation because it almost forces them not to be deeply rooted. Again, she's using the language of rootedness. Um, it's just like if they are in Liberia, if something pops up, they can just pick up and leave and go somewhere else. So there is this level of like non-attachment to a place. So I think that, and in the case of Liberia, having people not be deeply rooted and not be attached to this place could possibly be dangerous. Now, if you understand the history of Liberia, you understand that um, it's a very diasporic nation. It's based on a movement, migration, and flux. And during the course of the war, a lot of people saw those who left the country and even were involved in fueling the conflict as those who lived outside of the country. So again, migration, mobility, um, not having one national identity fixated in citizenship is seen as dangerous and as threatening. On the other hand, there's something called the nomadic metaphysics, right? So people see citizenship, again, as unbounded, that multiple citizenships should be the norm, not necessarily as an aberration. And this is a frame that's rooted in, or in this notion of rootlessness, right? So in this frame, movement is seen as the natural order of things. Um, mobility is progressive, it's exciting, it's contemporary. And stasis is actually reactionary, dull, or of the past. That is the aberration within this particular frame. And a lot of people argue that because of Liberia's protracted armed conflict, because of so much movement as a result of the war, Liberians should not be penalized for naturalizing elsewhere. That this sort of rootlessness frame is one that should be embraced, right? There's a quote that I'm gonna share from um, a Sierra Leone-based respondent of mine who says, if a man must contribute to this nation, 
most of us, especially like Liberia, the man must go out of the country, he's talking about the movement as being natural again, and if the man goes out, he acquires knowledge that can help Liberia. If you will stop a man from being a citizen in another country that will be contributing to the man's development, indirectly contributing to the nation Liberia, then it means you'll be hindering the development in Liberia. I support dual citizenship 100% because the book, and he's talking about the passport, can change, but the heart cannot, right? In terms of concluding observations, what I realized throughout this sort of analysis is that, again, in 1847, when Liberia was established, Liberia was, was a country of relative immigration, right? But what was interesting about citizenship norms is that they were particularly biased against those who were rooted. So those 16 ethnic groups that were already in the territory that's modern day Liberia were not considered citizens when the constitution was established in 1847. There's a mistake in this, you should say in 2017, so 170 years later, effectively, um, Liberia is a country of relative immigration. So a lot of Liberians live outside of the country. But in the 21st century post-war moment, citizenship norms are biased against those who are rootless, right? So those who have citizenship abroad or those who have residence abroad. Now, what I argue um, sort of in conclusion is that the dual citizenship legislation, the proposed legislation, has to reconcile the tensions between these two different frames, the sedentarist rootedness metaphysic, as well as the nomadic rootlessness conceptions of citizenship. And until those two frames are reconciled, the particular bill will continue to be contested. So thank you for your energy and time, and I look forward to questions um, and a discussion afterwards. Thank you very much, Rob Tell, for reminding us that perspectives on autochtony and claims to land change depending on who makes them when, whether it's the incomers um, or whether it's the incomers that have become the autochtones that have become settled. I think this is all very much related um, to different models of conceptualizing languages because we also have this passport um, idea of language as being related to one exclusive identity. You know, you can only be a fully fledged member of a hypothesized group if you have the language, which can only be one or sometimes two. Um, and um, I think uh, our last presentation um, of this panel by Amidou Sani. Um, will explore uh, similar tensions uh, in a different regional context, that of Ajami in the Yoruba area of Nigeria. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge the efforts of uh, the chair, Mashoud Badiering, uh, Federici, Angelic, and others. I also want to acknowledge the uh, presence of one of the greatest SWAS alumni around in this hall. He was here in the 60s, Professor Isaac Ogumbi, a teacher and a mentor. Professor, stand up for recognition. Yeah, that's uh, my teacher and mentor. And uh, when I was coming he in here this morning, I had a very, was very much high spirit. But I, it got dampened once I came in here for a reason. I saw Philip Jagger and Graham Furness a few moments ago, and uh, they are all retired now, but not tired. <laughs> and something just occurred to me when Valerie was giving her introductory remarks about uh, Suarez trying to have uh, Swaz African cooperation, whatever. And I asked myself whether Swaz would be able to retain its identity as a leading, if not the leading center of African studies in the next 100 years. Well, that might be too optimistic, maybe less in the next 25 years. For the simple reason that the two experts in Hausa's, in Hausa language are retired and no replacement. The only expert in Yoruba as well, Akiwitari also left in January this year, no replacement. And I asked what becomes of this 
optimistic note of having a greater soil in the next uh, century. And I think that is one issue I want to, uh, us to address our minds to. I mean, all this uh, will be good for our own uh, academic exercise. But the real survivor of uh, Suez as a leading center of African studies, uh, not losing its identity, is very, very important. And I think uh, at the end of the day, maybe later this evening, when the Emir of Kano comes around, you may want to tell him that he might lose his identity as an Emir, and he might lose his Emirate if Hausa finally gets a. Uh, uh, one way or the other, out of the system in Suez. And I understand uh, the owner of FIFA was also here sometimes, maybe this year or late last year, I don't know. You may also want to talk at whatever platform about the need to get the Yoruba something also on board. And I have a simple suggestion here. Uh, you know, lawyers, they say they are the only learned people. We are all educated. Professor Badori is a lawyer, and uh, you may want to advise that some of this Nigerian money in British vaults or whatever, only well, God knows how much the money is, can be set aside a little bit part of it to acquire chairs and tables for House and Yoruba, if that will help. And of course, may also appeal to these big Nigerians, what we call Baba Mutum in Hausa, that they could uh, sort of uh, encourage the big, what we call the money banks, to donate chairs in Hausa and Yoruba to assist Suez. Uh, in this regard. So that's uh, my preliminary remarks, and I think we should all think about it to ensure that the identity of Suez as a leading African center and as a uh, generator of knowledge and transmitter of knowledge continues. And uh, well, I've tried to use that so that we can have something to think about. And uh, since uh, Frederick has decided to use the uh, symbolism of football with the yellow card and the red card, and I want to say that maybe, you know, the best of goals don't come in the regular times, but in injury time. <laughs> so now I've decided to reverse the order of bringing the injury time first so the message can, can sink. So thank you very much for that. Well, I wouldn't, I have a small writer which I wouldn't read at all, but I'm just going to I have about 10 or 11 slides which I want, just want to show and talk to those slides. Uh, well, this is the linguistic map of Nigeria, and for those who are not familiar with Yoruba, where it is spoken, uh, if you are familiar with the history of uh, slave trade, you know, from the 15th to 16th century, a lot of uh, Yoruba people were transported to the Atlantic and the U.S. and whatever. So this area is where Yoruba is principally spoken, and of course we have uh, Yoruba speakers in neighboring Benin Republic, and of course, even today in Brazil and whatever. So, and that is, uh, for those who are not familiar, and it may also interest you to know that the first translation of the Quran into any African language was done in Yoruba in 1911 by the CMS. So that tells you how important the language has been. And you have a lot of Yoruba materials, uh, the British Society Library in Cambridge, and a lot of documents out there in Sao Tome and uh, Principe and whatever. So, now, uh, well, I've tried, I wouldn't talk much about this idea, this mischievous idea of Africa being a dark continent. And I think it's, there's no point talking about that any longer now. Recent developments have shown that Africa was actually a very bright continent before European uh, colonialism. And uh, this, this one, I've just taken this out to show that many of the Africans who were sold into slavery had been very, very much intellectually sound in their home countries or in the home state, so to say, before they were, and I've brought this one from uh, uh, Paramo, Thomas. Now, uh, talking now of Yoruba, Ajami, that is, of course, all language, of languages which use the Arabic character, whether Pasha, whether Urdu, Swahili, or Hausa, it's known as Ajami. There's no doubt about that. And uh, I've brought here something to show that the Yoruba people of Nigeria have actually been using the Ajami since the 17th century. And the oldest history of the Yorubas in the 17th century, the website is there, was actually written in Ajami. That is Yoruba language using the Arabic character. So just to show you how. Now, what you are seeing here is the oldest Yoruba Ajami by one but I must say I'm from Ilori, 
central, not central Nigeria. And you can see it's actually multi, uh, bilingual, let me put it that way. And recently, some multilingual uh, West African Najami have been found in uh, the diaspora. We have Hausa, Fulfude, Yoruba, whatever, by either those who were engaged in the, in the World War, or what we call the Great Wars, or those who found themselves in whatever form outside the Nigerian shore. And this particular one is both is multilingual, and it's, uh, the author died around 1895, and it's so far the oldest uh, Ajami, Yoruba Ajami you have around. And it's a poem, and you can see the strong influence of Arabic, classic Arabic poetry in rhyming and in meta being used there. So I won't bother you about that. So if you want to learn it, you have to enroll in an extra class. <laughs> now, then again, since uh, for quite about three decades now, for about three decades now, there have been attempts at evolving a standard orthography for the Yoruba language, or for the Yoruba Ajami, so to say. And one of the earliest uh, writers in this regard is uh, Professor Ogumbi, is also there about the, what, the problems of uh, having a standard orthography for the Yoruba language. But this particular one is by one of the Nigerian academics. Of course, I've tried to put together the attempt by three uh, of four major institutions or individuals, three individuals, one institution, in trying to find a, a standard orthography for the Yoruba language. And the first one is by this man called Ahmed Abu Salam, from, uh, he used to be in Malaysia, but now in Nigeria. And he tried to evolve a standard way of writing the Yoruba language in the, with Arabic character. But all of suggestions are not practicable and at the end of the day, it didn't, it didn't work for a variety of reasons, which I won't be able to tell you because of time constraint. Uh, this is, uh, yeah, this is uh, uh, the, the thing uh, of it in uh, the Latin character. Let us write Yoruba language, Arabic orthography. That's the way it puts it. And this is the second attempt by one. Abu Bakr Yusuf, also from Ilorin. Uh, and you can see the, the, his own form of Ajami is there, and the his, uh, transcription of it is also there. And the Yoruba alphabet, R, B, D, whatever, is also what is proposing as a script, uh, to, uh, the equivalent to you. That one is equally fraught with a lot of problems. And the basic thing I will tell you very shortly. This is another attempt by the same person. Now there had been a group, a society, that is involved in formalizing Yoruba orthogra Arabic orthography. Because at this time now, they have started using the orthography of the Yoruba Ajami to write short stories, to write prescriptions, uh, prison notes, and things like that. So the use was becoming wider. And so there was, especially among those who were in the mystical order, they were trying to evolve a sort of writing which they thought would be less cumbersome than Arabic. But of course, it proved to be more cumbersome than Arabic itself. And uh, that one, so uh, this one, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, let us try and come back. Yeah, yeah, this one ha also has some problems, which I won't be able to tell you for now, but it uh, was not workable in the sense that the dialect of Ilori, you know, when you are looking for the best dialect of Yoruba, you won't go toward Ilori. You talk, think of the Oyo, Ibadan, Oshogu Axis, the central Yoruba land, not the Ilori kind of thing. So there were some problems with his own prescription, so it couldn't be used. And so they were trying to evolve a sort of a journey for Quran, or to see a, a explanation of the Quran, purely religious text. But again, Yoruba, a journey had gotten widened. I'm, Gotten to be used outside religious something, so it couldn't be limited only to Europe. And so that attempt also failed. Now, this last one is by one of those, you know, the ISESCO, more or less the equivalent of uh, UNESCO. It has it's, uh, with the Islamic uh, Educational and Cultural something, in, uh, both in, I think, in Maghrib or in, in North Africa, anyway. Now, they try to evolve or to develop standard orthography for 10 African languages, Hausa, Fulfude, Swahili, and all whatnot. And Yoruba is one of the things they try to have a standard orthography, but the thing ran into a problem. Those, they were en those that were engaged in doing this were basically also from the Ilori axis, 
which does not represent the core Yoruba land. And so some of the suggestions these people made, because they, in the first place, they were not expert in either linguistics or in Arabic uh, linguistic or English linguistics or even Yoruba linguistics. Because they were speakers of the language and they knew some Arabic, they said, okay, yes, they will be good. But the fact that you are an English person doesn't make you an expert in English. That is the problem. So their effort was not successful. Now, I you see the kind of thing the ICSQ was doing was that trying to develop uh, the Quran in Ajami. Now, an ordinary Muslim, whether from Yoruba or Hausa, will not read the Quran in Ajami. He may not understand the letters, but he will read it in Arabic, whether in prayer, whether in anything. So even if he doesn't understand a single word, letter of Arabic, he will still read those things. So these things now that have been prepared for African languages are basically not usable because it has no audience. Uh, Muslims ordinarily will not read Quran in Ajami. And of course, to read Ajami, you must have some basic knowledge of Arabic in the first instance. So for whom is the effort meant? None. And you can also see that the Isesco problem uh, started from two points. His philosophy was that, okay, they were trying to develop standard uh, Quranic orthography for Muslim peoples of Africa, as if only Muslims use the language or the languages. Hausa, Yoruba, whatever, is, are not only used by Muslims. The second one is that they say, uh, the, the philosophy is that they were trying to uh, develop uh, Quranic orthography, uh, uh, African languages according to Quranic script. The fact is that Arabic language is not meant for Quran alone. In fact, Arabic had been around before Quran. So once you now made your effort or your, your intention know that you are going towards a purely religious direction, of course, you have shut out those who have no inkling, uh, sort of uh, sympathy or affiliation to Islam or Quran in the first instance. So, and so the effort of Francesco has not also succeeded. And from the about 10 projects now that have been done into Africa and Germany, you can see the materials uh, which, through which these have been developed are religious texts. Quran, uh, of course, you have this one from Juzul Lama, the 30th part of the Quran. Manual of Hajj, when you are going to Mecca, they also have a standard manual which is written in Ajami. The third one, as, as far as Yoruba is concerned, is what we call the, the basic text in Islamic theology, they call Al Akhtari, which is very popular throughout West Africa. And the fourth one that has been done with this thing is also the biography of the prophet. So all these materials now, uh, through which they were trying to establish uh, uh, the sort of uh, transmit knowledge, had not been successfully uh, successful, let me put that way. Because nobody has been able to use it, and the, uh, the idea has not been uh, very much welcome outside the strict uh, people of the Muslims. So I'm rounding up. Uh, yeah, well, and of course, just, just by the way, to show that uh, Ajami is not only used by Muslims, uh, what we have here is uh, uh, the Holy Bible in Hausa, in uh, Hausa Ajami, and what is uh, Bishara de Gahanon Luca, that is uh, the gospel according to St. Luke, which is purely Christian. And of course, when the, the German evangelist, uh, Rahan Bonke, came to Nigeria some 20, 30 years ago, he was using the Hausa Ajami to propagate Christians, and that caused a lot of problems in northern Nigeria, a lot of killings and whatever. So uh, uh, the use of Ajami has been wider than anticipated. And this is, of course, uh, the Ajami material from the uh, West Africans in diaspora. And I got some of this thing from uh, Nikolai. And uh, some of the things I was able to discover was that you have elements of Hausa, Fulfude, Yoruba, and so uh, all these are still waiting to be properly discussed. Uh, thank you very much. Amidu for reminding us in this concluding presentation how complex identity is and that these entities, these groups that we construe or that different stakeholders construe actually fall apart uh, as soon as we look at what people do. Um, before I go over and kick off the panel discussion, I would ask audience members who have written questions on index cards to kind of pass them on so that they reach the front and 
um, I can get them while I kick off the discussion with one question of my own. Thank you. When listening to the presentations in this panel, I was struck by uh, one red thread of many. Huh? Oops, sure. <laughs> Sorry, because we now don't have oh, yes. We just want to move a little bit. Absolutely. Sorry. Okay. One, two, three. Is it how many tables? <laughs> One red thread that I found emerged in all the presentations was the role of institutions in fixing identity in various ways, starting with Rama's, uh, where is she? Here, yeah, she is. <laughs> Rama's presentation on land rights and how they're negotiated locally and how then they have become legalized mm -hmm. and the tensions that arise uh, from this. And then uh, going over to Rebecca, um, about multiple histories, hidden histories, about one archive that is inaccessible, the institution that actually blocks access, and the, the potential of having several archives. So again, the institution fixes and excludes. <clears throat> and then we had Camille, who was also talking about uh, bounded languages that actually serve uh, uh, hegemonic uh, power structures and are not related to language use, disempower language use, and, and the institutions that do that and that also implicate academics ourselves. And uh, then again, Lutz reminding us how colonial this is um, and um, how it is continued today by um, the formal institutions that have supplanted the colonial administrative structures. And, um, yeah, Rob Tell was next, um, reminding us um, of the different models of creating identity through citizenship and how formal models and institutions like states that give citizen rights um, also exert a power, a defining power, and exclude, depending on their perspectives. And, and then uh, Sunny, of course, who we just heard, reminding us of um, these institutions that continue standardization for an audience of whom? <laughs> I don't know, until today, and uh, citing ISESCO. Now, of course, we could also cite UNESCO here, and SIL, major language planner, um, literacy planners in Africa till today. And so I wanted, since we are uh, supposed to talk about Africa's future, I just wanted to ask all of my panelists um, of what kind of institutions you could imagine that allow this fluidity, ambiguity, these different perspectives that have emerged in your talks. Look, you look like, you mentioned, you know, you, you actually mentioned in your talk the need for new institutions. Yes. So do you have ideas? You must have some ideas. I, th thank you very much. There, there's there's one, one other thing, maybe, if I may, um, which, which came out of Rob Tell's talk, I think, which I thought was really interesting with the, with the rootedness. Mm. And it reminded me in, in the 1980s, I think, the Birmingham Cultural Studies Group, they were playing, it was Stuart Hall and people like that, they were playing with notions of roots versus roots. So they, they had this word game where they had the root with the double O, yeah. which is down, and then roots with the O U. Yeah. And you define, you know, yeah. your, whatever yeah. it is with, mm -hmm. the, with the roots. But the, the nice thing about that was that you could have multiple roots. Yeah. 
I mean, OU ones. Yeah. Um, and I think that was, you know, I, that links quite well, actually, I think, to Friederike's question. Um, with, the, with the institutions, I'm, I'm not sure. I think in, in the context I've spoke about, certainly in East Africa, I think the institutions as such are probably okay. I think it's the reformation of the institutions and what they do and the, the approach and attitudes to things, rather than, I think, a, you know, a, a change in the way they, they are done. I think, I think it is about, it's about participation. I think it's about listening. It's about, it's about getting a much better understanding what's happening on the ground. Um, and that's better reflected, you know, for language, the key, key institution, of course, is education. Um, that's where standards are imposed. That's, that's where you, you, know, you grade students as to whether they do it right or wrong. Um, and I think the risk is if the rift between what you as the institution thinks is right and what people actually say you know, in, at home, in the market, on the street, when they talk to each other, indeed what they use, the language they use in, in digital spaces, if that rift becomes too big, I think you have a problem because you start excluding. Um, and I think one thing which, you know, it's a, it's a, I guess it's a global issue. Um, my personal feeling is that we have to be much less strict and restrictive in what we accept as standard on the, on the education. So once you allow things like Schengen, and you know, once you allow things like Schengen education, I think it, it buys in a big constituency which otherwise is marginalized. And of course, the interesting thing, that's why I showed the Barclay examples, that's what, you know, the, buy, the buying in of Sheng is happening already at the commercial sector. So it's an interesting time, really, because I think the power of the state institution is undermined in different ways through this crowd-driven crowd development. Um, but also, of course, to commercialization and, and economic factors. And then, on the one hand, that's a risk because you don't want your, your you know, public policy being run by, by the commercial sector. But on the other hand, you can harness that and manipulate that and turn that into the goals which you think are socially better. Um, I, th I think I'm stopped there, yes. Yeah, I'm glad you picked up on the roots versus roots because it's actually a frame that I use in the paper that um, is going to be published soon by Migration Studies. Um, and what I argue is that, you know, this transnational impasse on dual citizenship has created roots, R-O-O-T-S, for some people, roots, R-O-U-T-E-S, for some. Um, and at least for me, in terms of my analysis, what I found to be particularly interesting is the fact that institutions are not fixed. Um, and that people have agency regardless of whether or not they are excluded by citizenship norms on the continent as well as um, included, right? So by, by definition, the institution of citizenship is exclusionary. Mm -hmm. by, by determining who belongs to a particular nation state and who has political subjectivity, you're excluding as much as you're including. And for me, the debate around dual citizenship, not only in Liberia, but across the continent, I might, I might, for, the, for the, the slide that I showed, where there are 27 countries that have adopted dual citizenship, they have not been without contestation. Um, and for me, that's the most exciting part, is that in our 21st century post-war moment in Liberia, we're having a conversation about what it means to be a citizen. Um, inside the country, domestically, quote unquote, rooted, but also outside of the country, by you know, the fact that so many diasporic groups um, submit remittances, and they are actually hoisting up households as a result of these um, transnational um, um, transfers. Um, and, and they have a stake in determining who becomes a citizen, regardless of whether or not they naturalize in other countries. And Liberians in the country are also fearful, legitimately so, um, that when you institute dual citizenship, what you really do is sort of open up a Pandora's box. What happens um, when people who are quote unquote not rooted leave the country and perhaps fuel conflict um, because of the history of protracted armed conflict in Liberia. So that, that institutions do not necessarily determine psychological conceptions of citizenship, that there are contestations, and that those contestations, that, that the state structures have to respond to those contestations, that they cannot just, you know, willy-nilly enact laws that people don't necessarily agree to. So again, institutions don't necessarily determine across the board um, what should and should not be as it relates to citizenship norms on the continent. So the power of the excluded, <laughs> the, the grassroots exactly. power of those that are not uh, actually in the institutions. Uh, Rama, I feel that you have something to say to this. <laughs> yes, uh, we were talking about citizenship, but I think it's important as well to, first of all, institutions. <laughs> I might first question what we mean by institutions. Coming from political economy, it might mean something else. 
But what do we agree about uh, when it comes to women, for example, in Senegal? Roktel was talking about how uh, in Liberia they are not allowed to transmit citizenship to their uh, family. In Senegal they can, but you see that it's a set of rules. You, they are allowed to do a certain number of things, but when it comes to parental authority, for example, women uh, cannot, um, for example, when the child has to have a passport, women mm -hmm. cannot uh, decide on that. But you have also uh, the land laws and so on. This is, uh, let's say, legal enforcement. Mm -hmm. Where the laws don't exist, we need to create them. But where the laws exist, enforce them. When they are inadequate, we need to make them make positive, bold, positive, uh, affirmative uh, actions. In Senegal, we have the parity law, mm -hmm. which uh, in elective bodies such as the parliament. Senegal is now the third I think countries uh, in Africa in terms of uh, representation. So I think where the law exists and are not uh, enforced, they need to be enforced. But at the same time, the state should not um, be as restrictive as uh, not allowing people who are already citizens to access the bundle of rights they, they, um, they are entitled to. Mm -hmm. I still want to tease out a little bit the contradictions that arise um, between, you know, the ones that are represented in the institutions. So, for instance, if we look at land rights in Senegal, um, I, I don't know uh, the legal code very well, uh, but I would assume that it has a very transparent, rational type of uh, law, um, whereas tenure and inheritance in, in many societies is really complex and a matter of interpretation. And it seems, for instance, to favor men in many cases, mm -hmm. but then you get matrilineal traces mm -hmm. in, in, in land inheritance um, mm -hmm. through mothers, brothers, um, lineage, etc. that then privileges women who at first sight seem to be excluded. Mm -hmm. um, and very often institutions only take you know, the face value and say, oh, this discriminates against women, and not actually taking the local antiquities and also the, the freedom of interpretation into account that exists in these non-formalized systems. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that that also is an important point of tension that we should take into account. Mm -hmm. So the institutions, even if they allow multiple standards, mm -hmm. they still are based on fictional, maybe, but still standards. Whereas the, the grassroots local uh, reality, I think, cannot be captured in any standard. Mm -hmm. um, and so that seems to me a very qualitative uh, difference that cannot be easily overcome. And uh, there's actually one audience question that is related to this that I wanted to pick up. And what is it? Um, how to, yeah, here it is. How to decolonize identity or identities um, academia and knowledge without engaging with and reifying colonial discourse. Because as long as we talk about a standard and we talk about concepts like citizenship, you're a citizen of an entity, so you already presuppose a bounded entity. Mm -hmm. You speak a language, again, you already draw a line. Mm -hmm. um, you have an ethnic identity. So all these lines, we have seen how they disappear in all the uh, linguistic examples that we have seen. We can label them because we have these reifications. Um, so we have a very monolingual, essentialist way of looking at fluidity, right? But um, Rama showed very nice in her song, you cannot actually objectively answer the question of how many languages are there or how many identities because it depends on your perspective. If you know many Senegalese languages, maybe you will find six languages. If you know only three, you will only find three. You have all these contested forms that could be, that are shared by many languages. So there is no objective way. And I think this is, you know, a, a real epistemological problem for me to try and, and get this fluidity into the institutions. Um, if I can comment mm -hmm. on this. I think it's especially a problem with languages because we, we are having to use and rely on these categories even though we're trying to deconstruct them and there's mm -hmm. no other way for us to communicate our findings 
but to use these categories. And it's the same way for, for anything to do with, with gender. We are having to use these categories mm -hmm. at the same time as we're trying to kind of de reify them. And, mm -hmm. and kind of going back to the institutions, even though the institutions are relying on these categories, what, what I've noticed in, in my research, for example, is even in um, events and workshops organized by the Ministry of Higher Education, what is happening on the ground for presentations, for Q&A sessions, etc., is the complete mixing of these different boxes to the extent that it would actually be really hard for me if I had to be sitting there saying labels. You could have somebody presenting in, if I want to put them in boxes, in English, and then somebody asking questions in um, standard Arabic, then somebody asking questions in Algerian Arabic, and the minister, the, the, uh, the person from the ministry applying in French. Mm -hmm. um, and then switching into a form of Algerian Arabic that would be closer to standard, etc. And that is all happening without anybody having to go, oh, sorry, I'm going to speak in, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. This is all happening completely seamlessly. So even though this is actually organized by the ministry, this is a ministry, um, representatives from the ministry speaking, they're undermining their own boxes themselves, and it's happening all the time. And it's kind of what I was trying to say about having to report on both the practices and the discourses, because it's not that discourse are not important, they are important and they're a way for people to structure their understanding of the world and their, their how people function. So we shouldn't just kind of discount them completely. Um, but it, it, it is a problem in reporting back in that we need some of these structures in order to explain our world or, 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 or findings to other people as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think it's maybe time to lead over to audience questions. So I hope we have uh, ambassadors with microphones who can get to people in the audience who have questions. And while we're waiting, uh, I think Rebecca wanted to say something. Mm -hmm. Yes, about the colonial discourse. Mm -hmm. I have had a bit of trouble um, deciding when to engage with it and when not to. Um, the, the problem is there is a lot of material that was written by the colonial government, by explorers and all that. It's very difficult to find things beyond um, before 1900, for example. There's a wonderful book by Rhiannon Stevens where she was engaging with language in <coughs> central parts of Uganda. So Buganda, Bugwe, Buganda, Bugwe, and Busoga. And she stopped right at 1900 when the, the arrangement, should I speak, should I say, with the, the British was formalized um, in Uganda <laughs> with the 1900 Buganda Agreement. And there's a lot of room, a lot of work that should be done. And I, I feel like there are a lot of avenues to decolonize knowledge in that way when we use, when we go beyond or before the colonial discourse and just um, not, there is though um, very little material. And like I said, especially for my country, there's, if you go via oral tradition, which is usually the way that we get these stories, there is a problem because we're very young now. <laughs> Amid wanted to yeah, just a, a few comments. Yeah. Well, I think in terms of institutional framework for these things, and I think SWAS, particularly the Center for African Studies, is a better place for this thing. Now, there could be, within the framework of the crossroad of uh, Frederike, a British Council, the Alain Francais, the ISESCO, all these can actually have a framework to work uh, and make this thing a cultural matter. I mean, of course, the West African something, the French uh, Sudan, the Af West African English something. So by having a sort of program that will involve the standardization of uh, uh, African writing system outside English. And of course, you have to involve the universities or the higher education institution, whereby you can actually develop curricula and uh, whereby people will actually learn these things and make it an object of knowledge production and knowledge uh, transmission. And I, in this regard, a lot of other languages that have this kind of script system, Arabic and something, for example, in Nigeria, you have the Afemai, you have the Ebira, you have the, a lot of them. So they can actually be taught in the university or the higher education system. It could be taken outside the religious realm. 
And so it is endangered, the EAP endangered archive program, of course, was once had this endangered language something. So all this can, can be actually incorporated, and the question of financing will not be a problem uh, once it is taken out of religious realm and made a cultural and educational thing. Thank you. Thank you, Amidu. I think um, we had um, several hands up, Mashoud and is this Detlef and a woman here, and then I see somebody there. Somebody at the back, yeah. Right, and at the back, I'm not so good at seeing at the back. So maybe we take these questions. Uh, thank you very much. I mean, I, I, something is just brought in my mind in relation to languages and identities, particularly and also linked to colonialism. Um, I want to look particularly in relation to Nigeria. Now, when we talk about identity, perhaps, I mean, within the national context, you have a conflict of identities sometimes based on language, actually. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, for example, in Nigeria, there's a big debate now. I mean, are you a Yoruba first? and then a Nigerian, or are you a Nigerian first, and then an Hausa? Now, for example, you find out that, I mean, there could be a, Niger a Yoruba in Nigeria who actually is much more comfortable with a Yoruba in Republic of Benin mm -hmm. than an Hausa in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. I mean, so you find out that, I mean, uh, if we are talking about languages and identities, and we are talking about development, I mean, perhaps maybe we need us to look at the implications of such sort of, I mean, multiple, I mean, conflict of identities. Yeah. And in Nigeria, now it's really very, I mean, big. We are talking, trying to pick the country together. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the time, people see their identity mm -hmm. in the language or the culture that they belong to, I mean, which might be linked much more to the same language and culture in another country, even rather than, I mean, another language within, within their own nationality. So perhaps maybe, I mean, could we look at this and see perhaps maybe the conflicts also, rather than, I mean, just only the, the, the positives. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anybody want to respond, or shall we just take the next take the question and then, then. Let, yeah? yeah? Otherwise. Okay, let's take the questions first, and then, so that we give you the occasion yeah, I to yeah. participate. I want you to address the issue of dual nationality in relationship to the power base. I feel that when you have a British passport, an American passport, it's based on power. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you have an African passport, yes. it's um, demoralizing, especially <laughs> when you're coming through um, the airports. Mm -hmm. I have a British passport, but I had a Jamaican passport. And one of the benefits of having a Jamaican passport is that in Nigeria and Africa, I was allowed to come in without, um, and Egypt, without being questioned. And I could take a citizenship of any of those African countries being from the Caribbean. And I think one needs to look at the whole issue of Caribbean um, citizenship in Africa. And I believe that the Liberian, model where you're talking about people not being able to have um, dual uh, citizenship. I think it's quite radical and a powerful one because basically I feel that um, we're giving credence to British passports and all that. When, when I changed to um, a British passport going into Nigeria, I had to spend over a hundred pounds for me and my children. Whereas when I had my Jamaican passport, I didn't have to pay that fee. I think this is a question that uh, seems to be uh, really central. So I'm just reading two cards for you as well. Um, there was a question to Rob Tell, is the category uh, americo Liberian still valid? So that speaks to that, I think. And... Um, also, there was a question about the role of the African diaspora 
in framing identity that I have here. So definitely an important issue. I'm aware that we are running out of time and I take the liberty to give us five extra minutes, if that's okay. <laughs> if not, you can vote with your feet and go and have lunch. Um, but bearing in mind that we have a full day ahead, um, I would rather like to take some more really brief questions maybe, brief and to the point questions and then give the panel some chance to respond and then we break for lunch. I see a hand up there, and there was a hand up there. I don't know if it's here. Maybe. Yeah, over there. <laughs> yeah, close that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Shall I turn, just because I had the microphone? Um, National relations managed by the Central Economical Powers and how the visas, like the passport, no, like people need a British passport to be more free, but that also is, implies that other ethnic groups feel more, less, like, less, I don't know how to explain, like, people feel less admiration for other ethnic groups because the international relations are dominated by these powerful countries. So mm -hmm. how uh, people who is in the lowest status of society can be empowered to claim their identities and also about the, I don't think people need to define uh, cultures to promote decolonization. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. um, my question goes to the first speaker, Rana. Um, you had a very good point about the relevance of identity in land use, but I wonder uh, whether that explains the whole story, and that's a question that, that concerns all speakers. So where are the limitations of the concept of identity? Does it explain um, the, the current uh, rising importance of uh, urban elites in land acquisitions? Okay, so maybe one last question and then we react. Mm -hmm. On the question of decolonization of knowledge, knowledge production, the last speaker mentioned that institutions like the British Council could be used as an, in the role or as part and parcel of the process of decolonizing knowledge and the production of knowledge. Um, how do you then separate the colonizer <laughs> and the colonizing framework from the decolonizing, from the decolonization and the decolonizational framework of knowledge. Okay, a lot for us to briefly react to. Um, any volunteers? Uh, there are a few questions. That okay. Mm -hmm. uh, is the category of American Liberian still valid? I would argue that it isn't because there's been so much intermarriage and movements and flux and migration within Liberia's history that this notion of um, an American Liberian elite for me is, um, is, is sort of antiquated. Um, but whoever asked that question, please come up to me. We can talk mm -hmm. about it in more detail. Um, citizenship tiers, you talked about that. I, there's, a, there's a scholar by the name of Yuval Davis who talks about the fact that there are citizenship tiers, right? So a British passport is much more powerful in the geopolitical system than a Liberian passport would. And it came up during the respondent interviews that I had where a lot of people said that they didn't relinquish their Liberian citizenship because they didn't love Liberia. They relinquished their Liberian citizenship because they recognized that they're citizenship tiers. That traveling with a British passport is much, it's much easier um, just tactically than it is traveling with a Liberian passport. So um, I, I would <clears throat> urge you to read up on Yuval Davis's notion of citizenship tiers um, and passport hierarchies particularly. Um, there's a question that was written on the, on the card about, is there a trend or bias for either rootlessness or rootedness by socioeconomic background? Um, again, the theoretical framework that I use is by a guy by the name of um, Norman Long who talks about the fact that people respond to policy prescriptions 
in the case of dual citizenship in my research, um, based on their socioeconomic positioning as well as their life world, so their lived experiences. And what I found was that the largest resistance to dual citizenship really came from those who were in Liberia, domestically rooted. Most of them had not left Liberia for long periods of time. Um, but that's not to say that many of them didn't support dual citizenship in the same way that those who lived abroad rejected dual citizenship. So it's very fluid in that respect, but the largest resistance came from those who were domestically rooted. And the reason they are so resistant to dual citizenship is notions of inequality in Liberia. They argue that I am a citizen of the country, but I don't benefit from the rights and the privileges therein, the way that those who live abroad do, who can come back and claim both citizenships in a way that I wouldn't be able to. So inequality is the crux of that resistance. Um, and then, you know, in terms of conflicts of citizenship, I think it's very, very clear, speci specifically my research, where a lot of Liberians say that I am more loyal to my ethnic group or my small geographic territory within Liberia or, you know, sub-political division than I am to the nation state Liberia. So I think there are, and I think that's a valid point to make, even within the citizenship frame. So I cannot follow that up just on the language on Mashoud's question. I think I think this, that's absolutely right. I think people have multiple identities in terms of the, yeah. you know, the, the, the ethnicity, in terms of the location, in terms of language, of course. I think I think the problem is that conflicts based on language or ethnicity typically are not about language and ethnicity. Mm -hmm. They're about, you know, yeah, yes. exactly. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, they're symbolic for something else. It's about, you know, access to wealth. It's, it's about, you know, people's feeling that they participate in something bigger or not. They're pre you know, prevented from that. And then, and then you know, these symbolic signs become, become instrumentalized mm -hmm. for that conflict. But there's nothing wrong as such in having multiple linguistic identities. I think that's really the key to bring that across and say, look, we all have multiple identities, and that's a good thing. And, you know, in, in Nigeria, that's, that's the real strength of the country in lots of other contexts, African, non-African, where we can draw on all these different you know, histories, traditions. It was, Rebecca was saying in her talk that she, you know, it's not so much rejecting stories, it's about getting more stories. And mm -hmm. that, that metaphor is really useful for identities mm -hmm. as well. And then we just have to be careful that it doesn't then get instrumentalized for, for the wrong reasons, really. Uh, mm -hmm. Can I respond to that one question? Well, I, why I was calling for the involvement of institutions like British Council, Allow France, and whatever, of course, they are not to be seen any longer as agents of colonization. Their current functions are more or less uh, cultural, so to say. So, and that is the way to attract the necessary expertise in terms of uh, equipment and personnel and funding, which is very, very important. A lot of African materials, for example, in the Ajami stuff, will have to be digitized. And this involves, so, and sometimes along these lines, actually happened with Wolof now, with Falun Gong from Boston. They have what to call the Ajami Library. And uh, so uh, my, the attitude to this is this. If the devil offers to give you a scholarship to read law, please take it, mm -hmm. as long as it doesn't require to be an, a devil's advocate. So that's, that's my, so let us, for whatever it might come, let us make use of it and then use that a means of generating uh, uh, diffusing knowledge. Thank you. Um, can I quickly, oh, sorry, no, yeah, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. um, about the identities, currently Uganda is going through this um, process where they're giving us national IDs and they're attaching this to service uh, provision to force us to get the national ID. So the phones went off at some point. I couldn't register my daughter for a birth certificate because I refused to get a national ID. Um, now, to this, I'm telling this story to answer the institution as well as the identities. Uganda has been loaded all over for open borders. We have had our borders open for a very long time. I personally am, I come from maybe like four different ethnic groups. Mm -hmm. And at home we speak maybe seven languages in one sentence. Mm -hmm. Now, if you ask, when I went to the Ministry of Internal Affairs, I, they asked, who are you? <laughs> And by who are you, where do you come from? Yes. You need to give one answer. I have four answers to that. Um, so again, the institution, I don't think that we need new institutions. I, like Lutz was saying, I think we need a reformation of the institu institutions that exist, which is why this space right now is exciting. And I remember we just had a conversation right now about uh, was this a very difficult, uh, conference to put together because you're opening the space to people like me who prefer to tell a story 
than use, I mean, I'll read all of the theory, but I think that that has um, limited access in many ways. So I would rather imagine sitting in a living room with my grandmother telling her the story of the migration of the Wanyaranda. So I, I think um, that what we need to do to decolonize again is find new ways of telling these stories, of, of transmitting this knowledge. And I think that will also give room for the multiplicity of identities, of movement and, and versions. I think this is a very beautiful way of ending this panel. I'm aware of the fact that I'm Sorry. cutting off Camille, Sorry. but I'm very conscious of time. And so uh, let me thank my panelists and the audience. Uh, for this